Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here today. At Google, I have the privilege, and my team has the privilege, of sitting side by side with technologists, creative directors, marketers, designers, to help them build brand experiences or ideas or products or technologies for the digital space. And my team in particular, we bring insights into what we call the culture of digital, what people are doing in the digital space. So you can imagine, when I first came to Google, how blown away I was with all the access to data that we have. En masse, we know what people are doing on YouTube, you know, how many videos they're watching, or how many times they're hooking up to their phone, or what social media sites are really popular. I was blown away. So cool. But then we figured something out pretty quickly. That, yeah, it's pretty cool to have all this data, to have all this, what I call, what, at our fingertips. But it was leaving us kind of cold. You know, it wasn't giving us the juice, the fodder we needed to create that really deep, emotionally resonant, human kind of experiences or technologies or products. And so we said to ourselves, you know what? We got to go beyond the what. We can't just ask what people are doing, what they're sharing, how often they're sharing it. We got to ask why. Why are people spending so much time uploading funny videos, right? Or, you know, why are they spending so much time on their damn phones? Or why do we have to have so many social media sites, right? Why? Because we believed if we could dig into the why, if we could understand the meaning behind all this behavior, ah, then we could unearth something truly amazing and juicy. And so to figure out the why, we partnered with those very people who spend their lives trying to unearth the symbolic value of things and rituals and products, anthropologists. And we conducted ethnographies around the world, added other social sciences to the mix, and layering our data on top of it, and what we found was fascinating. And that all this digital play, yeah, it may be fun, or functional, or even sometimes frivolous, but it's more than that. It's deeper than that. It's actually really meaningful and powerful. And more than that, it can amplify human experience. It allows us to assert and unleash deep-seated human needs and desires like never before. And so for the few minutes I have here with you, I'm going to share a few experiences to bring that to light. Now, there's no question we can't live without our phones, right? I mean, I see a lot of you are already getting bored looking at your phone. I mean, there's no way I would have gotten on this stage on time without my map app. But our relationship with our phones goes far deeper than that. I'm going to share with you just one example of that. Yes, we live in a highly virtual world where we can have hangouts with people from Timbuktu, Tokyo, Texas, all at the same time, and yet we still are hardwired, we still fundamentally want to connect with the physical places and spaces that surround us. That's why we care about decorating our home or the local haunt around the corner. These places ground us emotionally. They serve as our foundational compass. Decades ago, Winston Churchill said, we shape our buildings and afterwards our buildings shape us. Every place has our memories attached to them. And those places constantly remind us of who we are. We call this act of adding meaning and value to places in anthropology, placemaking. And our smartphones allow us to placemake like never before. Thanks to the texting and the scheduling and the picture taking, all of that allows us to placemake. Now you're probably thinking, what? I'm going to give you an example. How many of you, luckily I can see all of you, how many of you have been to Hell's Kitchen in New York? Raise your hand. Okay, enough of you. Okay, good. That, that orients me. And for the rest of you, I think you're going to get it. So I walk through Hell's Kitchen on my way to the office every day. And if you haven't been through Hell's Kitchen, it's basically restaurant after restaurant after restaurant. And it's like wallpaper. You just you, you ignore it, right? But imagine this. 
All of a sudden, I happen upon a restaurant, catches my eye. Well, right then and there, through the portal of my mobile device, I can investigate. Well, what is that restaurant all about? Who's the founder? When was it founded? What's the cuisine like? I'm interested. I walk in, and thanks to Yelp, right, I know where to sit. What's the best seat in the house? What's the best dish? So I sit there. So I order it. It comes to me. It's gorgeous. So what do I do? Of course, I take a picture of it, right? And then I send that picture out to the ether to my friends. And then somebody immediately texts me back and says, oh my god, I love that restaurant, because that's where my husband proposed to me. Oh, and by the way, add chipotle sauce to the dish. It'll taste so much better. All of that, all of that, that picture taking, that texting, right, that investigating, all of that allowed me to add meaning and value to a place that I normally would have just passed by. So as I partner with my colleagues and I, we think about what do we want to create in the mobile space, I say to them, don't just think about the functionality, which is huge but also think about its ability to allow us to dimensionalize our neighborhoods, allow us to place make. And an artist who got this really well, Bob Dylan, a few years ago. Dylan was promoting his new album, The Tempest. And what did he do? He created an iPhone app called Sound Graffiti, which allows you to unlock songs from his new album in certain places and spaces that have significance to him and his music. So what happens is that not only do you get the surprise and delight of unlocking a new song, but then you associate that music with that place, adding more meaning and value to it. So cool. Now let's move from the small screen to the big screen for a second. Thanks to the web, we have access to the world's masterpieces. We can get up close and personal to sculptures and paintings like never before. And yet, let's be honest, most of what we upload and download and share are picture after picture and video clip after video clip of everyday things, right? What my buddy ate for dinner last night, the dog jumping, or how about that latte shot? Everyone's seen the latte shot with a swirl on top, right? Or wait, how about a tire? Uh-huh, seriously, I had to present at the mothership, you know, at Mountain View. When I wake up one morning and there is a picture in my Instagram feed of a tire. What gives? Who cares? Ah. But when we started investigating our feeds more closely, what we notice is we don't just dump everything in there, right? No, no, no. We carefully winnow away, picking those shots or those clips or those images that are kind of, they're shot or juxtaposed or positioned in such a way to offer us a new perspective. We see these everyday things through a new light. Maybe it's that bowl of cereal, or maybe that's latte. It kind of looks a little different. All right, but that hardly constitutes high art. What gives? Well, the answer is surprisingly deep. You see, since the beginning of time, we have all asked ourselves that gnawing question that always seems to crop up when we're sitting in traffic, which I know we had a lot of today, or filling out forms, or waiting for that delayed plane, where we ask, is this all there is? Is this my life? I know I have. And since the beginning of time, Greek playwrights and ancient religions and philosophers have sought to answer that question by feeding our appetite for wonder and discovery in the everyday. We've heard it, there's a term for it, like Proustian, right? Because Proust said the voyage of discovery is not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. I love this quote, right? Because you see, we crave, we seek the wondrous and the beautiful in the everyday to show ourselves that what we wear and those lattes we drink and where we live aren't mundane, but are full of wonder and full of discovery. So fast forward to today, and we are attracted to those everyday memes and clips and images, especially because of their everydayness, made that much more interesting. Right? What they do is they elevate our everyday, making us see our world with new eyes making the familiar fascinating and reigniting our love affair with the world. And so as we think about creating stories and experiences, right, 
let's not always try to reach out for that, you know, unknown thought or insight, right? Maybe it's about helping people rediscover the beauty of what they've forgotten, right? Helping them see the fascination with the familiar, and sometimes the tiny, tiny familiar. And a great example of that is what Mont Blanc did a few years ago. They won a few Cat Awards for this. And I love this example so much because Mont Blanc is a luxury brand. And for many years, and it's gotten better, but for many years, luxury brands were kind of like, eh, to the digital space. But these guys realized they had to do something different because they were celebrating the 150th anniversary of the chronograph, which is a technology that measures time in intervals of a fifth of a second. And so instead of doing something that, you know, is going to cost bazillions of dollars with gorgeous celebrities in far off locations with award winning cinematographers, you know what they did? They solicited videos from everybody, one, a video sec of one second of their life, of their daily life, not an extra extravagant scene, one second of their daily lives, and then they curated them. They brought them in, they curated them, and they created these gorgeous videos. It was just fascination with the familiar. I wish I could show it to you. I don't have enough time on stage, but definitely during a break, show it. I mean, show it to yourselves, show it to each other. It's beautiful. And I bet you, you're going to go like this when you see it. And you're going to hear the person next to you go like this when you see it. And there's no coincidence there. In fact, most of what we share, clips, pictures, videos, elicits this reaction. Sometimes it's a ha 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 reaction, right? Or it's a something from the body, from the gut. It's like this energy-inducing kind of experience. And I'm not talking about, you know, the article you share with your boss because you want to look smart, right? I'm talking about this stuff that you're sharing with your, with your spouse, your partner, your friend, your cousin, right? It's, it kind of elicits this from the body reaction. Why is that? Because of the happiness we feel when we know that others are experiencing all this energy and effervescence and pleasure with us. Now, wait a second. We live in this altruistic world all of a sudden. Kumbaya, everybody wants everyone to be happy. No. We're hardwired for this. You see, from our earliest months of life, we learn that by offering gifts of happiness to others, we get that much more pleasure in return. What's our first gift of happiness as a baby? It's the smile. It's called the social smile. There's a name for it. Now, what happens when babies smile at their moms or dads for the first time? Someone in the audience, tell me. They smile back. And babies feel this, oh, this love. And then they do it again. And then they, you know, right? And this extends to our larger social network as well. We learn that by offering gifts of happiness to others, we will get that much more pleasure in return because we know we're bonded. By the way, there's a lot of evidence to show that when babies start smiling like this at four months, the mother-baby bond escalates. And this is why we tickle our children. Chimps tickle their children to elicit this <laughs> reaction because they know it'll connect them. And so when we get a energy-inducing or laugh-out-loud clip or video or image. We can't just watch it and then put it into a folder. No, we feel compelled to share it. Because we're not just sharing it, we are sharing in it. And we're not just a consumer of all this energy, we get to be a provider of it too. Constantly fueling this connection we have with others. And we call this the energy exchange. And the energy exchange reminds us that we're connected I'm not just sending you something frivolous, right? This reminds me that to you, and to you, and to you, I matter. And so as we think about creating sight, sound, and motion, and stories in this space, don't just think about what you're trying to say, think about what you're trying to emit, right? Oops, sorry, I'm gonna go back. Gift happiness. Be a source of energy, because not only will pe people feel connected to you, but they will feel compelled to share it. And if you don't believe me, have any of you ever, raise, a, raise your hand, have any of you ever seen an energy-inducing, laugh-out-loud piece of content about feminine hygiene 
that not only you enjoyed, but you want to share. Right? Never. Never. Yep. And I pressed, ah, there we go. I keep on pressing the wrong thing. There we go. I know you were just, you were just so excited to find out who that was. Hello Flow realized this. Hello Flow realized, no, we're going to change all that. Hello Flow is an overnight feminine hygiene delivery system, right? And what they did is they created long form pieces of hilarity in this space. They understood the lingua franca. And not only did, scale, did sales skyrocketed, but I am proof of the success of this because I am a mother of an eighth grader. By the way, an eighth grade boy, nonetheless. And yet all the mothers were sharing this content around because it was so freaking hilarious. Now, again, I, I don't have time to share that, but I, please, if you want to have an, an amazing laugh, you must watch it. But I am going to spend, in the last minute we have, I'm going to share with you one last piece of content. And the reason why I was so excited about sharing this with you all today was that I used to share this story when I was doing just my um, narrative about the mobile work we did, and unearthing the, all the, the great insights. Because what, what the story is, it's about this gentleman named John Butterall. He's a photographer. And he uses the phone, he hooks up his phone to the camera, and he uses the Hangout device. And so there's a great insight, it relates to a great insight. But what I realized soon is that every time I showed that video, I love to see the reaction from the audience about not how smart that video was, but what it made them feel. And I always felt a little bit like, I think they like me more. So, you know, I was just in Australia last week, and I said, I'm going to dump that video in one of my presentations and see what happens, and it worked. So I'm going to share this video with you now. I cut it off a little bit. It's a, sometimes a little hard to hear because um, there's a woman with MS who is represented in this video, but I think you'll get the idea. So let's have a look. This is John Butterall. One day, I was out taking pictures, and I thought, how cool would it be to attach a phone to your camera and hang out with five, ten people? And they would see exactly what I was seeing through the viewfinder of my camera. <laughs> it's gorgeous. It was pretty amazing. And uh, the next day, Corey Fisk came into the hangout. I love photography, and I have been living with MS 10 years, and this is my world. There's nothing more to my world than that. I just said, tomorrow, I'll take you for a walk. I'm going to walk closer to that old tree over there. Down a little. OK. A little more. Right there. Lovely. Look up. Look way up. Oh, I like that a lot. Yeah, back for that one. Got it. For a few brief minutes, she wasn't going to be in that bed. She was going to experience her own momentary escape. She was on a virtual photo walk, and we didn't even know what one was then, but we were sure doing it. The next day, we posted the video. People saw it and started sharing it, and photographers all over the world jumped on board. So we're bringing lots of people around and giving them Hawaii view here. Oh, yes, we have the sea turtle. Look at this. Oh, oh my goodness. Ah. In beautiful Cape Town, a couple of buffalo. This is Utah Lake. I'll be emailing you photos soon. I never anticipated that so many photographers would give their time and feel so committed. As a photographer, you're in a special place taking pictures. And now people are with you. And for that brief time, you're giving them a little bit of freedom. I'm just going to sneak around here. It's a very rewarding thing. Can you guys see what I'm seeing at the moment? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that is something. <laughs> that these photographers were not feeling that energy exchange. And I swear I felt it right now, too. And so I hope you see from these fun examples, and there's so many more, that yes, it's cool to play in the digital space. Sometimes it just gets us through our day, and sometimes it you know, allows us to do something fun or stupid. But there's so much more. It's deeper than that. 
There's so much meaning here and so many ways to express who we are and to find out who we are. So I hope you enjoyed this little discussion. I really thank you for your time and I truly look forward to meeting so many of you throughout the day. Thank you.